Hello everybody and thank you very much for joining us today for this special webinar session that's been designed for our computer science offer holders who will be joining us in September. Um, so we've got about three months to go before the start of term so we're just going to give you a quick overview of your school of study and a few tips for start of term as well. Now, the session is recorded. It's nothing to worry about. It's just in case anybody's connection drops, we'll be able to share the recording back later on for you as well. So if you do miss anything, don't worry. Um, now, just to give you um, a quick overview, my name's Kat and I work in the international office. Oh, and I'm Nathan, Nathan Vadu. I'm the head of recruitment in the Department of Computer Science. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nathan. And it's a pleasure to have you on the session today as well. Um, so for the session, for all our attendees, um, we'll give you that introduction to your school of study. So we'll be covering quite a lot of information for you um, about what you can expect once you arrive here in September. We'll then move on to information about start of term preparation. So things you can do now to help you hit the ground running in September. And then at the end, we'll have our Q&A. You can ask questions throughout if you do like. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A instead of the chat if you do want to ask a question to the panel, just because the chat tends to move quite quickly and we might miss your question. OK, so we'll just do a quick poll now just to see who we've got in the audience um, and which subject you're coming to study. So you might have some fellow classmates um, in the session with us today. So it's an anonymous poll. Feel free to take part if you want to. Um, so I'm just going to launch this on your screen now. So it's just to find out which subject you'll be studying when you join us in September. So you should see that button on your screen. Feel free to take part. I can see some answers coming in already which is excellent so I'll leave that open for another minute just to give you a chance if you do want to um, take part in that quiz question as well excellent so lots of answers still coming in almost everybody's answered now which is brilliant to see so I'll just give it another moment or so um, and then we'll have a look at those results together OK, so I'm going to close the poll in in just a minute. So if you are hovering over the button to take part, please do submit your answer now. OK, and we've ended the polling, so we'll have a look at these results together. So we've got a really nice mix today. Um, a lot of people doing the computer science or advanced computer science, some for cybersecurity, data science and analytics, um, networks and system security as well and software engineering. So um, you've probably got a fellow classmate here in the audience today with you. OK, um, what we'll do now then, everybody, um, we'll move on to the introduction to your school of study. So I'll pass to Nathan, um, who will take us through this section. OK, thank you, Kat. Next slide, please. Right, so welcome to the School of the Department of Computer Science in the School of Physics, Engineering and Computer Science. Now, as you can see in the background, there are two almost humanoid robots in the background. These are what we call a RoboCup team of robots. We have built and delivered and literally tutored these two robots, there are more of them, to play football. They do play football almost as though they were human beings. And this is one of the strongest areas of our endeavor here in the Department of Computer Science because we teach artificial intelligence and we teach robotics. So with AI and robotics, we are able to extend what we teach into our research and therefore be able to build <laughs> these robots and get them to compete in worldwide football games, okay? So that is just a little, a little, a little taster for you to have an idea of what we do, how our taught programs end up extending into our research programs. As is department generally, we have a very strong relationship with business and industry. In addition to our research profile, we also have a fantastic relationship with business and industry, which means that our students tend to do industrial placements 
in the top companies around here in Hertfordshire and also in the southeast of England generally and some abroad. As a department, we, we used to say we were the first to start a computer science program in the UK. But then again, we realized that some 20 years ago, some other institution, I think Essex University came and told us that we are actually not the first. So out of all the universities in, in this country, would you believe it? We, we are the second oldest department of computer science in the UK. That is because we were the first to recognize that all the subjects that people did that related to the art of computing or the science of computing could actually be brought under a big umbrella called computer science. And we were the second to recognize this and do it. So it means that we know how to teach or how to teach what is in the can. We know how to teach you what is underneath the bonnet. We know how to teach you what it is that makes our systems operate the way they do. Okay. So if you've chosen to come to us and you haven't chosen to go to Cambridge or Oxford or Imperial, you made the right choice. We may not be Cambridge or Oxford or Imperial, but we are the second oldest computer science department in the UK. And as you have seen from the poll that you actually um, did yourself, you can choose from a variety of specialist modules and specialist awards, from biocomputation to machine learning, to data mining, to robotics, to software engineering, and so on and so forth, yeah? And we have world-class learning facilities. I don't have to tell you that. Look at the robots we've got. If we can invest in these humanoid robots, each robot is worth a quarter of a million pounds, okay? If we could invest in a quarter of a million pounds kit, yeah, just to teach our students robotics, then it means that when it comes to teaching you programming and software development and data mining, there is no shortage of facilities that would make available to you. Next slide, please. So facilities, what do we have? We have, traditionally we had a networking lab, okay? This networking lab doubles up as a cybersecurity lab. If you teach people, or if you teach students cybersecurity, you must teach them cybersecurity in a safe way so that they don't, <laughs> they don't knock, they don't break your, the school's network, right? So we have a network lab for teaching network generally, but these days nobody does networking without actually doing cybersecurity. So we have a fantastic cybersecurity lab. It sits about, we've got three of those and they each sits about hundred students. And then we also have robotics labs, as you can see, there are in the top right hand corner, we have a robotics lab where we have an industrial robot called um, Baxter. And we teach you to program this robot to play chess. At the bottom right hand corner, we have other robots, scalar robots, whom we use to teach you to get you to write programs for navigation. At the left um, bottom corner, we have another robot, uh, a social robot, okay? There are several of these social robots. And in the middle of the picture, we have a typical lab for teaching programming, normal stuff. So we have labs for teaching how to program. And then we also have labs for getting you to do specialist things like robotics, social robots, emotional robots, and so on and so forth. That is a lot of space. That is a lot of space. 3000 square meters of space is a lot of space. Now, let me tell you something else. At the bottom left-hand corner, you see a wonderful man with a gray beard interacting with a robot. That robot is serving that man biscuits. Now that exists in our robotics house. We've actually got a house for robots, a whole, a complete house, you know? And in that house, we have robots living there and they tend to live there with human beings. And we have an area of our research called human-robot interaction. And in, in our attempt to advance our human robot interaction, we have built an entire house, put in some robots, and there are human beings in there. <laughs> and the human beings interact with the robots, and the robots learn to interact with the human beings. It's one of the most fascinating areas of research. So if you come to us and you do something in robotics and, and, and you want to extend your research, then you could, you could work in the, in, in, in the robot house. But there are several of such spaces. Overall, if all you're doing is programming and you, you want to build applications, we have a 24 seven learning resource center, which will give you access to using our facilities 24 seven. 
So some of you may want to work on a Friday night, others may want to work on a Sunday night, Saturday night. Our facilities are always available for you. Next slide, please. This slide shows you a little bit of what we do in computer science. The School of Computer Science at the University of Hertfordshire is one of the largest and most established in the UK. We have a world-class research reputation in areas such as biocomputation, software design and CPU architecture, and our leading research in artificial intelligence and robotics feeds directly into the teaching you will receive. Our courses provide you with the essential theoretical knowledge as well as the opportunity to specialise in areas of software engineering, networks and artificial intelligence. And as a student, you will also have access to a number of industry standard computing laboratories. Our network labs and cutting edge robotics give students the opportunity to apply practical skills. These skills, developed in programming and control, can be applied using our Baxter robot, a dedicated robot specifically for use by our students. You can also benefit from extracurricular activities such as working with our RoboCup team, the Bold Hearts. The team includes students from undergraduate, postgraduate and research and finished runners-up in the 2014 World Championships in Brazil and are currently the top-ranked robot football team of their class in the UK. The Computer Science School has developed strong links with businesses ensuring our curriculum is designed to meet the needs of employers. These partnerships mean we can provide excellent support for students undertaking an all-important student placement and prepare you for your future career in the technology sector. Excellent. So everybody you saw in that video is actually a professor in this um, department. The first person you saw is a chap called Professor Daniel Polani, and he is a head man for robotics. He's a person who uh, deals with all the ro robotics research, the main robotics research, and he is a person who built um, the Robocop, the, the football playing robot. The second chap you saw is Dr. Vito Veneziano, and he teaches software engineering, he's a software engineer, same as me. And so everybody in that video is an active um, lecturer in, the, in, in this department. And as you saw, you saw our students being taught to use Baxter in terms of um, artificial intelligence, teaching that industrial robot to play chess. And you also saw our students being taught how to program uh, RoboCup um, robots to play football. And you also saw our students being taught the fundamentals using vectors, okay, the notion of vectors to write programming languages and things like Scala and Python and MATLAB. So, we are a hands-on department. We take you, we teach you the fundamentals, and then we bring you up to the uh, advanced stages. And then we input our research, and then we, we, we throw you into the wild world. And when you get to the wild world, you are super clued on to um, be a practitioner. Now, all our MSc degrees are going to be accredited by what we call the British Computer Society Chartered Institute for IT, BCS, okay? The BCS is the overall accreditation, accreditation um, body in the UK. So since we started our master's project, our master's program a few years ago, we have sought for BCS accreditation. And as we speak, the BCS is visiting us to carry out the application, that um, accreditation. So by the time you guys leave here, you would have received that BCS accreditation from um, the Chartered Institute for IT. And that kind of like, it's almost a seal of approval in terms of it ratifies the qualification that you've got from us. We also have within us in the, in the department and in, this, in the university generally, a careers and employment team who would provide you with three years of job search support. So if you're here, for your two years as a master's student or three years as an undergrad, you will have at your disposal a careers and employment team. And they bring in employers, they send you to interviews, they teach you how to write a good um, application, how to put together a fantastic CV, 
how to approach your interviews and literally they bridge the gap between you, a student looking for a job and the employers looking for freshly graduated students who can help them in what they do. So our links to industry play a big part here because we've got loads of um, um, giants in the industry who would want to work with us. Next slide, please. So to say, to move on from what I was saying, we have strong links with industry. Um, some of the big companies, we have loads of companies, but we've only chosen a, a few to give an indication. Sega Europe, a huge company in Europe. Canon is another company whom we have um, links with, our students work there. And EE, EE is a mobile phone provider, a network provider, and uh, our students work there. So a lot of our graduates from uh, both the undergrad provision and the postgrad provision have gone on to work for all these companies, Hewlett Packard, Neuros, they, some work for the police, some work in, in, in hospitals, okay? some, people, some work for small companies like My Utility in Harrow. There are lots of companies, depending upon where you want to work and how, how, how comfortable you feel, you could either be working for a multinational conglomerate or you could be working for a small company or you could be working in the civil service or you could be working for the national health service or you could be working for Google and Apple and so on and so forth. Yeah. Second slide, oh, sorry, second point. A lot of the people who graduate from us don't just graduate to become maybe a programmer. Some graduate to become generally software developers. Some have an interest in developing web applications, so they become web developers. Others want to become business analysts, okay? Depending upon what they do. Some want to become database administrators, project managers, IT consultants. Um, some want to do research, so they join research labs, okay? So generally, if your flair, if your strength is in one particular niche of industry, depending upon how well you do and how well you take your studies, you would find a particular professional path to, to, to get you. You could become an AI analyst. You could become somebody working in um, machine learning. You could become somebody working in the financial sector, doing actuary, building financial systems to predict the, the rise and fall of stocks and so on and so forth. If you do data mining with us and you do data science, you would learn all these techniques to allow you to do this. If you do cybersecurity, you could become somebody working with the police. <laughs> you work with the police and you help the police determine most effective ways of stopping cyber crime. Okay. You could work with the National Health Service and, and, and schedule operations and workloads for the overburdened doctors and GPs and surgeons and so on and so forth. You could apply, my dear friends, you could apply your expertise and your knowledge from our program in lots of ways. Next slide, please. So here again is another testimonial from a student. I actually taught this student. So here what she has to say. I always loved learning languages and computer science, it focuses on computing languages and programming languages, ranging from Java to Python to C. It wasn't necessarily a course that I had considered seriously because I was thinking, you know, I would take up a subject like law or business or management. So I just thought, you know, it would be worthwhile learning about tech the computer science course has been really straightforward. I really do feel that it has helped me develop the skills I need in order to apply them and develop them further in a career in computing. Despite being a commuting student, I don't feel as if I have missed out on uni life. I chose the University of Hertfordshire because they have a range of facilities on campus that are open to the students. The library, for one, we have two libraries on our campuses. We also have a range of societies you can participate in. One society in particular that I'm 
currently in is the Japanese society. I also take part in active student sessions. You can basically take part in any sports that you would like. For example, for me, I would always go along to the badminton sessions and just play whenever I wanted to, all for free, on campus. Aside from meeting many other students across the university, you also get to have a chance to maintain a healthy living lifestyle alongside your academic studies. Back in my second year, I actually took part in a hackathon. And after competing in that hackathon, I won two awards with my team. The first being best teamwork and the second for best female hacker. For my placement, I was basically contacted by the CEOs of the company that hosted the hackathon. And they offered me a year long placement which I, at first, wasn't considering at all. But I thought, you know what, the opportunity has presented itself to me, I'm going to take it. When I compare myself to when I first came in to uni, I am a very different person in terms of confidence, skill, ability. I have developed on all of those areas and more. Even sitting here doing this interview, I don't think I would have had the confidence to, you know, comfortably throw myself out there in first year. It really, really does put things into perspective and you really see how far you've come. For me to realize that really shows that the whole process and journey of going to university and learning skills and then to later apply them really, really is amazing. So that's a very excellent testimony from one of my students. I'll pass you on to my colleague, Kat. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, Nathan. Lots of information in there. So hopefully that's given everyone a bit of a boost about what to expect. Um, I'll run through the section now on preparing for the start of term. And then after that, we'll go to q and I know some of you have been asking questions already, which is excellent. Um, so preparing for the start of term now, you'll all be at various stages of your application journey. Um, some of you might still be clearing your last few um, few parts or you you should have already paid your deposit now if you're attending this webinar but you might have some conditions to clear such as sending in your final transcripts make sure that you keep an eye on the emails from admissions because they will let you know what to do next you might also be called to complete a sponsorship interview or financial checks if these are requested of you um, you'll be sent an email confirming what you need to do a bit of guidance on what to prepare for your documents as well or how to complete the recorded interview and then once you've completed all your conditions um, then you'll be in the queue to get your CAS so the admissions team are creating CAS every single day um, you're going to the queue to get yours and once yours is ready it'll be emailed to you as well and then once you've got that you can make your visa application. Um, if you are unsure about what you need to do next, please do contact us at international at hearts.ac.uk or for those of you with in-country representatives that you've been speaking to, you can also check with them and we'll be able to have a look and see where you are in the process. Now, a few things that you can do now while you're waiting for your documents to be checked um, is you can complete the free online module called Getting Ready to Study at Hearts. So the link to this um, is on screen now. We'll also include it in the chat for you. Um, but this module is excellent so that you can hit the ground running in September. So do take the time to work through it. Um, it just covers a lot of things like um, the support teams available on campus, so the wellbeing team, the Dean of Students team, the SU. There's also some video tutorials of how to use the online resources like StudyNet and Canvas. Um, there's a few video testimonials from existing students as well about things they wish they would have known before they came to the campus. So do check it out. It's well worth it. 
You also need to make sure that you have arranged your accommodation. So if you haven't already, please do make sure you sort that and it must be arranged before you get to the UK. So you make sure you've got somewhere to stay. Now, if you do want to stay on campus, which is what we'd recommend, especially if it's your first time coming to the university, um, you can apply for your room with your conditional offer and you'll get your room offer once your deposit has cleared. So once you get your room offer, you'll be invited to pay your accommodation deposit to secure that room and then it's yours. There's lots of different rooms to choose from. So depending on um, what level of privacy you want, you might opt for a studio room where you've got your own kitchenette and bathroom, or you might choose a room where you've got the private bedroom, but you share your kitchen and bathroom with other students as well. So do check out those options on the website. If you do really want to live off campus for any reason, um, please stay as close as you can in the Hatfield area, because it just means that if you do need support at any point while you're studying with us, the teams can get to you easier. And also you'll be able to walk to your lectures so you're not having to pay commute costs to travel into the university. Um, if you are staying a bit further out, make sure that you've looked at the bus or train timetables to make sure that you can get here for either earlier morning or later evening lectures. Make sure you've researched how much those train or bus tickets are going to cost you because you might actually find that it works out cheaper for you to stay on campus or in the Hatfield area so that you're not having to pay those commute costs. So make sure that you do do your research and look into that. Now, if you are set on staying off campus, another really important point for you to remember is to choose PAL accredited landlords. So what PAL is, it's a scheme that the university has set up with the local council um, just to make sure that all the properties displayed on the PAL website, they're in a good state of repair. Um, all the facilities within the property are in full working order, like any washing machine or cooker. Um, and also your deposit will be held securely as well and the properties match the photos that you see on the website. So do make sure that you are checking those out. And lastly, just another reminder, make sure that you're keeping an eye out for those emails from the admissions team to clear off your conditions to get you closer to CAS stage. Now, a few things to look forward to when you do get to the university. Um, so we'll be giving you a bit more guidance about um, traveling to the university. So pre-arrival guide, we'll be loading that soon onto our website with all the relevant information for those of you starting in September. Um, this will have a lot of details on from cuisine that you'll be able to try when you get to the UK, cities that you might want to visit, alongside the more important information about packing checklists, how to get from the airport to the campus if you're using public transport, what to do if you get a visa refusal. So do make sure you've taken the time to read that once it's all ready and updated for September, we'll email it round to you as well. We'll also be doing some pre-departure webinars, so a similar format to this session, um, which will just cover everything you'd need to know to help you feel comfortable about traveling to the UK. So that session will cover things like um, how to navigate through the airport, what you should and shouldn't be putting in your hand luggage versus your hold luggage, um, and then just a few tips about airport collection as well. So the university does run a free airport collection program, which is from Heathrow to the campus. And this happens um, usually one week before the start of term. So it's the weekend before our orientation week, which is going to be around the 17th of September this year. But once that's ready, we will send out an email so that you can book onto that as well if you are flying into Heathrow on those dates. Now, travel requirements, um, this is excellent news for those of you who are going to be coming to the UK. So you no longer need to have COVID tests before you travel. You don't need to fill in a passenger locator form and you don't need to quarantine on arrival anymore either. So our cohort that started in January, they did have to follow these rules. But luckily, things in the UK have eased off and improved a lot. So you don't need to do that anymore. However, do make sure that you check the rules for your country that you're flying from. They might have some regulations in place where you might need a COVID test before you get on the flight. You might have to wear a face mask during the flight or going through the airport. And that's the same for any transit countries that you might have a changeover flight with as well. So do make sure that you've checked on those rules. 
Um, now then we'll also have our orientation and freshers programme. So the orientation week starts one week before the start of term and freshers week starts with the start of term. So freshers will be the 26th of September with orientation the week before. Now, do get involved in these. If you can make it to campus in time for the orientation week, that's a fantastic opportunity to start making friends, learning your way around. Um, they have a lot of social events that week as well. So usually things like food festivals, quiz nights, movie nights. Um, there's also some more practical things like giving you um, a walking tour to the local supermarket so you know where to go and how to use the self-service checkout tills. Um, so lots to get involved in and there'll be a timetable really least closer to the start of term as well. Now during those activity weeks um, you'll be able to also meet some of the clubs and societies that we've got on campus and your students union reps as well. Um, so there's hundreds of clubs and societies, something for everybody. Do get involved, it's an excellent way to meet friends who've got the same interests as you. And if there is something that you're particularly interested in and the society doesn't already exist, you can speak to the student union rep and they'll help you set up a society for that as well. Now, there's also some sports clubs at the university um, and you'll have the chance to represent the uni at competitions against other universities as well. Um, you don't have to be an expert. There's something for all abilities. Even if you're an absolute beginner, please do get involved. Um, the active students team, they do do a lot of free sports trials, especially around the start of term. So you can give things a go and find something that you might like that you haven't tried before. And then there's also the chaplaincy and religious groups that you can get involved in too. Um, now, with the COVID situation, I know that some of you might still be a bit anxious. Um, the situation is different across various countries around the world. So we just wanted to reassure you that um, we have created a COVID secure campus so students and staff um, can keep learning in a comfortable environment as well. So what does that look like? It means we've increased cleaning across the communal facilities, the common areas around the classrooms. Um, there's also been taken into account with the timetable in as well. So most lectures will end five minutes before the hour and not start again till five minutes after the hour, just to give students a chance to um, get out of the room and new ones to come in. So it's not too many people trying to get in and out as well. There's also food delivery options from the on-campus shop. So if you are staying on campus, you can download the app and get a delivery to your room as well. So if you do have to isolate at any point um, during your time at Hearts, that option will be available to you. And there's also support teams in place to help you as well. And if you haven't been able to get the vaccine in your own country, don't worry, it's not compulsory in order to be able to travel to the UK, but you will be able to get the vaccine once you arrive. So once you're registered at the university, you can enrol at a GP in the UK and then just let them know where you're up to with your vaccine. If you've had one um, or if you've had two, but not your booster yet or none at all, just let them know and they'll be able to book you in for free for any extra top ups that you need while you're here. So what we'll do now, we'll move to the Q&A section. So if you do have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll be reading out your questions and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, so we've got a few questions coming in, Nathan. Um, now, I can see that somebody in particular is asking about they're coming for the MSc computer science. They know that it's quite different to the advanced computer science and some of the other specialist courses like software engineering. Mm -hmm. um, but they just wanted to know what practical knowledge um, they will learn as part of the MSc computer science and how it will help them secure a graduate job. OK, so thank you for that question. The MSc Computer Science is designed for students whose first degree is not in computer science, okay? So what the MSc Computer Science tends to do is it will take you somebody who's probably studied humanities and within the one year, turn you into a computer scientist. So what will happen is you will have the same practical skills as somebody who has done a BSc in computer science. However, because you've already done a first degree somewhere else, you've got the project knowledge, you've got the independent project research knowledge. So your research skills are stronger and higher, but your technical skills as a computer scientist 
will be lower when you join us because you haven't done any programming at all. And we will turn you into a computer scientist. So you will be able to compete with the undergrads for jobs in systems development. You would also be able to compete with the postgrads for jobs for all the other systems development, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity. But the emphasis is the fact that it is for people or students whose first degree is not in computer science. So if you're a quick learner, you may get as much of the technical competency as the other students on their advanced routes. But the other students on the advanced route come to us and we don't teach them how to program. That's the difference. We don't teach them how to program. We don't teach them how to model data. I do databases. We don't teach them the fundamentals of networking, i.e. cybersecurity. And we don't teach them the fundamentals of uh, systems development or software engineering. They know all these because they have already done a degree in computer science. And so we build on their expertise, okay? What they've already done. With you coming in with an, to do an MSc in computer science, we will teach you all these things. If you're a quick learner, <laughs> if you're a quick learner, in the first semester, you probably come up to scratch. And then the second semester, you would be at the same level as the, the students doing the advanced, advanced computer science um, and, and data mining and data science and bioinformatics. I'll give, I'll give you an anecdote, okay? I'll give you an anecdote. One of our strongest researchers in this department who came here to do um, computer science with us, came in, came in with a geography degree, no computer science background. And this person joined us, did the MSc computer science, was so good, he got a distinction. After the distinction, his grades were so good, we got him to do a PhD with us. He finished his PhD and now he works with us. So it depends on how fast you learn. But if you're not a quick learner, the MSc computer science allows you to get the same technical skills as somebody who's done the BSc computer science. Mostly students who decide to do the MSc computer science are people who want to either become educators themselves. They want to go and teach other students or they want to do research, or they want to get um, a degree level computer science job. So you learn how to program, you learn how to build systems, you learn how to build databases, you learn how to secure systems. Yeah, and then if you're exceptionally good, you may probably decide that your final um, project will be in machine learning or something to that effect. I hope that answers your question. That's excellent, thank you, Nathan. Um, we've got loads of questions coming in, which is excellent. So we'll try and answer as many as we can. Um, now, I've got one that I, I can answer here. So somebody's asked about um, the sh shared facilities in the accommodation. Are students responsible for cleaning the bathrooms or are uni staff responsible? So it, it is the student's responsibility. So usually if you've got a shared bathroom or shared kitchen, um, you'll be in what we call either a townhouse or a flat with other students. So those facilities are yours and you'll work together um, as, as a household, as housemates to keep those facilities clean. Um, and it, it just it's better for you if you are looking after them yourself as well, because it builds that responsibility in the home environment as well for you. Okay, so I've got a few other questions here. Um, somebody's asked, uh, let's have a look. Somebody, if we've got a few people asking about the placements, Nathan. Various courses are asking about placements. So I don't know if you could help give a bit more information about how the placements work, what people can expect about placements. Um, that would be excellent. Okay, so so the, you're coming in September. I hope all of you are coming in September. Some of you probably come in January. The, the placement is a one-year pay placement. And the placement opportunities are available to students who are doing all the awards, except those who join us in January with the MSc Computer Science. Now, if you join us in September, you would do one semester, two semesters of learning, okay? 120 credits of learning. And then within 
the one, the two semesters of learning, you will be attending placement interviews. Placements are organized by the placements office. Like I said to you at the beginning in my presentation, okay? The placements office is a career office. Employers come there and say to them, we have these job opportunities. We want a data scientist. We want a networking person. We want an artificial intelligence person. We want somebody who could build databases and so on and so forth. Like you would see in any job center anywhere in the world. So our students go there and they look for job opportunities and then they apply to these jobs. But what we do is we help you with developing your CV and we also help you with identifying your um, interview, the strengths in your interviewing techniques. And then you will go and you will go and attend a job interview as you would in the real world with several other students. If you impress the um, prospective employer, you get the job. If you get a job and you start in September, then your placement will start sometime in July or August of the following year. You do that for an entire year. You get paid, depending on what the job is, you get paid a reasonable amount of money, same as the UK rates. Within this placement year, we will come and visit you once every term, so three times a year. And within this placement year, we'll expect you to write a report about what you're learning on the placement. So you just don't disappear into a placement hall and not come back. We check on you and we also expect you to write a report. That report will come back and it will go onto your file, okay? So it's a paid placement whereby you work in an industry and you would have imp impressed your prospective employers that you are able to add value to what they do. And they would impress you by giving you lots of money to live on. And you would impress us by writing a report of what you did on that placement year. Some of you will be coming to us with some technical knowledge already, fantastic. However, in order for you to join the placement program or to qualify for the placement program, within the first semesters of learning, you should have proved that your grades are good enough. So let me give you a scenario. You can't turn up with fantastic technical knowledge and then join the program in September and not pass any modules and expect to go on placement because getting onto the placement program is incumbent on how well you do on the taught program. And think of it from this point of view. If I'm an employer and I'm employing somebody from a university, I want to see how well they've done in their programming modules and their software development modules in their networking modules, okay? In the artificial intelligence modules. So if you're doing well, and because we're doing a master's pro program, the pass rate is 50%. So if you're getting 70% and above, and you've got, you've done all these um, two semesters of modules and you've got 70% or 60% and above, you are impressive. The employer looks at you and thinks, that is a fantastic student. So it is that transcript of your results that opens up the doors for you, okay? But you work for a whole year, you earn a lot of money, and we come and visit you three times in that year, and then you write a report. And then when you come back from that placement, you have three months to do your final year dissertation. Somebody was asking about MSc projects. It's worth 60 credits, you do it in three months, okay? And that final dissertation, what is it? Well, when you do your undergrad, you do the dissertation, you probably, you, you were learning how to write a dissertation. So you had the problem space, you identified a solution space, you built an artifact and you wrote some text around it. And then you wrote a Gantt chart and you said, this is what I learned. No. If you do the master's project, you take an original idea. You say to yourself, everybody says, maybe object oriented programming has a harsher or a higher threshold in terms of success than event-driven programming. But many of the companies I have worked with do not use object-oriented programming, they use event-driven programming. So how could I test the thesis that object-oriented programming has got better efficacy? Yeah, that is an original idea. It's a fantastic idea. So you have to collect data, primary data, to help you test that thesis. So it's a question of doing some practical work to support an intellectual uh, query 
you have an intellectual query, you do some practical work, the practical work will give you solutions to that intellectual query, and then you write an entire dissertation about it. And that is the independent thinking that I, I kept telling you about. If you can do a fantastic massive project, then it means you're on the way to, be, to being able to do a PhD. And a lot of our master's students have to be PhD potentials because the next step from a master's is a PhD. If you've done your master's, where else do you want to go? Well, you want to go and more money, but if you want to study again, what do you want to do? You do a PhD, okay? So I think I've answered two questions to do with placements and to do with the master's projects. I'm trying to kill two birds at one stand. Excellent. Thanks again, Nathan. Loads of really good information in there. Um, I'll just cover this question very quickly. Somebody has asked, um, will there be any racism on campus towards international students? Now, I just want to reassure everybody, racism is not tolerated on our campus. Um, it's it's not something that we would hope that you would experience at all. We do have a very big international community on campus, so you'll be meeting people um, of all races from around the world as well, all nationalities. If you do experience anything like that at all, please do alert staff as soon as possible because it's not something that we do accept on campus. So I would hope that you wouldn't experience anything like that, but please do inform staff if you do, and action will be taken straight away. Um, now, we've got a few more questions. So I can see some people are asking about um, how many days do we have classes a week and how many hours? Now, I know that varies depending on the course, the modules you've chosen as well. Um, so I assume that it'll be once you've selected or any uh, optional modules, your timetable will be generated after you've registered. And that's when you'll be able to see what your class timetable is, how many hours you're in each week. But you should be expecting to do full time study hours, because even the time where you're not scheduled to be in a lecture or a seminar, you need to use the rest of your time each week for personal study, working on your assignments as well. So do expect to be doing full time hours, which is 37 hours a week in the UK. Um, now, I've got a few people, Nathan, asking about if, they, if they're not able to get onto the placement routes, if they've opted for that, um, would they be transferred to the advanced research route if their course has an option for this? Yes, I think, I think all, all, the courses, all the courses have an option for the advanced research route, with the exception of partic some particular entries. So if you're unable to secure a placement, mainly because you have not started the process of securing the placement earlier, or mainly because you probably did not want to secure a placement and then you change your mind, then you have the option to do advanced research. And the advanced research, the research route or the research period is the same as the placement period. So as opposed to going out there and in so many, you would be with us studying better research skills. Okay. So you are going to become a better researcher as a result of that one year of doing advanced research. So think of it from this point of view. If you got a, a placement, you'd go out there and then you become a better practitioner because you've got a year's industrial experience. But when you do a master's, there are two routes. The first route is to go out there to industry and earn a lot of money. The second route is to come to academia and become a researcher, do a PhD and become a lecturer like me. Okay, so. The advanced research route is intended to ensure that if you don't get a placement, you don't waste that one year. So we, we put you back into the system, back with us. And this time we teach you independent study skills. We teach you independent research skills. We teach you our research philosophy. What is a research philosophy? If I'm about to do research, what's the ontology? Okay, What is the epistemology of what I'm doing? How does that affect my research methodology? How does that impact on the research methods and the data collection tools that I have? Okay. So we teach you all these things. And then we teach you the notion of what is qualitative information, what is quantitative information, what is that um, positivist view of looking at life, what is the um, um, subjective view of looking at, at life, okay. what's the objective view of looking at life? Okay. What is, if I say I'm doing an interpret interpretivist research, what does that mean? What is a constructivist research? What does it mean? What are, the data, what are the tools that you can use? So many things. You may think that you've studied everything you need to know about research until you come to do the advanced research with us. So there's lots of things that you can study. And then once you've done the advanced research for a year, it means that 
if you're applying for a PhD and you're being asked to put together a research proposal and you're being called to an interview to talk about your research proposal, you are in a far stronger position than anybody else. Secondly, if you're applying for a job as a researcher in any research institution or any laboratory, you have already been equipped with the skills to allow you to become a researcher. So you don't lose out because you haven't got the placement, the um, paid placement, you gain by becoming a better researcher because that's the option that you've chosen. There are students I know who come in for the advanced research route. They don't want to do the industrial placement aspect. They want to become researchers. So they actually choose the advanced research route. So that's how it works. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Nathan. Really good. So hopefully um, everybody's taking that information in a lot of details there as well. Um, now, there's a few more questions that I've seen that I'll um, I'll highlight for us too. So I know that somebody was asking about um, programming languages for the MSc software engineering with placement year, but they've just asked um, what programming languages would be needed for those studying MSc software engineering? Well, if you do have a software engineering, we'd expect you to be able to program anyway in the first place, okay? And we expect you to be able to pro program in any object-oriented programming language. So Java to start with. Python, okay? So Java and Python will be sufficient for you and a bit of C++. But what is more important if you do an MSc Software Engineering is your ability to be able to identify the way software engineering is done these days. We don't build systems in isolation. We build systems concurrently. You're building the system with somebody else. So revision control tools, Git subversion, SVN, okay? Those are the sort of tools that we use. You don't build programs using a flat plan-driven approach. We build programs using an iterative, agile, repetitive approach. So you should be able to work in an environment, an agile environment, using Kanban, okay? Using things like Scrum, using things like extreme programming, okay? So you should be able to understand all these things. And then suddenly, you also must realize that these days, a lot of the fantastic companies like Eclipse and NetBeans have developed beautiful IDEs for us, yeah? Integrated development environments. And those environments allow us to do what? To write test cases even before we program. Those environments allow us to build, to control the way we build little bits of programs. And those environments allow us to do test-driven development and so on and so forth. So the whole notion of being able to understand concurrent development, build or test-driven development, build control. Those are, the, those are the more important things. The programming languages are Python and Java and whatnot, Scala and SQL and C++, Swift. But you have to be able to know how software engineering is done in today's environment. That is what we will teach you with. But come in with Python and come in with Java. That is the baseline. Things like SQL, we expect you to have already learned it before you got to us, okay? For a bit of the databases and the data science. Scala will teach you that. MATLAB for um, robotics and um, yeah, a lot of other beautiful languages. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And somebody's asking um, did, if they're doing advanced computer science, do they need programming knowledge? Most definitely. I mean, you see, I didn't even allow you to stop to fully speaking before I answered. If you're doing advanced computer science, we expect that you've done a degree in computer science. And if you've done a degree in computer science, we expect you to have done three years of programming. And if I have accidentally um, <laughs> given you an offer onto an advanced computer science route without having checked that you have done three years of, computer, of, of programming, then I may just rescind that offer. That was a joke. <laughs> I expect you to have done three years of programming, okay? And to know and understand the basics of programming, to understand the nature of programming, to understand the fundamentals of programming. You may have not done Java. You may, have not, may not have done C++. You may have done C Sharp, okay? You may, you may have used JavaScript, which is an easier way of learning how to program using object orientation. But we expect you to have done programming because we don't teach programming on any of the specialist routes, we give you 
exercises that require you to program. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean we don't do program. We do lots of programs, but we don't teach you how to program. We expect you to know how to program. Okay. There are fundamentals of programming which are only done on the MSc computer science, which we teach. That's teaching you how to program. But for example, in software engineering, we have um, a module called programming for software engineers, which means you have to know how to program first before we teach you programming for software engineers. What do we do when we are software engineers and we are programming? We have to teach you how to know how to program concurrently, how to use pair programming as a tool where two people write the same code to the same problem at the same time, okay? Concurrent control, whereby you write in the same program with somebody in another, in another geographical location. When do you branch a program? When do you check out the program? When do you check a program to your sand pitch? When do, you, when do you check it back in, okay? When do you commit a program? And so on and so forth. These are the things that we teach you in advanced computer science and in software for, sorry, programming for software engineers. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Nathan. Um, we've probably got time for about two more questions. Um, so one of them I can see, which will probably be relevant to all courses. So somebody's asked, does a student get a mentor when they're enrolled onto the course? Well, yes, you do get mentor of sorts because when you are about to do your, um, let me start all over again. You get a mentor. There are six, seven award titles, and each award title has a program lead, okay? So in addition to having Dr. Gani Nashi as the overall lead of the MSc, you'd also have people like, um, let me remember the name, yeah, Dr. Nick, okay? As one of the leads of the, um, 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 the, the award titles, and Dr. Suatu as one of the leads of the award titles, somebody else. So there are about eight of them, and they're all heads of the various award titles. And they would initially look after you. Okay. So, but then when you go assign your MSc project, or when you decide to do your MSc project, you'd have a project tutor. And that project tutor has a one to one with you. So initially, there will be a one to many mentorship system in place between you and the assistant program leaders. And then you will also have a one-to-one -one mentorship process later on when you begin to do your MSc projects. And the industrial person, do have two or three industrial leads in the department who help you get a placement, they would also serve as mentors, okay? So in due course, as time goes on, we will reduce the ratio of, the mentors to mentees and make it smaller, which means that that mentor has a lot more time for their mentees. But you'd always have somebody looking at you to an extent. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Nathan. And I think this will be our final question of the day. So if we haven't been able to answer your question, I'm so sorry. It's been so good to see you all engaging, but you can uh, send any questions that we haven't been able to answer to international at hearts.ac.uk and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, but the last question, I'll keep it a general one that could apply to everyone. So I can see a lot of people asking, um, is what preparation should they do before the courses start in September? Is there anything that you would recommend to them, Nathan, or anywhere they could see uh, sort of recommended reading lists? Okay, so let me let me. There's one. There's one preparation you should do before the course starts in September. No matter how good you are, no matter how well you've done before in your previous studies, brush up on your programming skills. Pick Python. Okay. Brush up on your programming skills in Python. Learn how to write programs left, right, and center in Python. Then graduate to Java. Brush up on your programming skills in Java. Okay, you've got now to September. If you could, you could write could comprehensively. Build programs in Python and Java. You'd be okay, right? Because the problem we have, or the problem we may have when you come to us is, if you think you're probably a very good programmer. But you get to us and we think now your programming skills are weak. But then the course has started. We're not going to put you in another course. You will struggle. So brush up on your programming. There are loads of programming tutorials in, on, on, in cyberspace at the moment. 
I don't want to ad advertise another university, but Harvard University has a lot of free programming tutorials. <laughs> so if you're struggling, if you if you learned programming a long time ago, hey, brush up on your programming. Python, Java. Yeah. If you have a lot more time, this applies to everybody. If you have a lot more time, read about the notion of data science, even if you're not doing a data science course, because data science is the next next big thing. Okay. How we can take data, the data you and I, this conversation is data. How we can use data to help us pattern events in future. What are the underpinning um, uh, underpinning structures to instrumentizing data science to help us do better things? How do we operationalize this, the data that we have around us using models to help us do better prediction? How, why does the credit card company stop your card when it thinks you have overused? Why do you get a credit card increase just at the moment when you think I could do with some money? Why do you get certain address being targeted to you? Why is so on and so forth, okay? So programming and a fundamental knowledge of data science, because data science permeates everything that we do, even if your award is not data science. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, um, we do also do some Instagram live sessions on our international Instagram account. Um, if you haven't signed up to any of those yet, you can follow along. Um, the previous one that we did, that was back on the 9th of June, but you can watch that back on the Instagram TV channel. And this morning, we also had a meet an international alumni who actually studied computer science. Um, so you can go and check that out if you did miss that session. It's all recorded um, and feel free to watch it back to hear about what Ballast is doing now um, and his time at Hearts as well. Um, so just a reminder, if we didn't get to answer your question, I'm so sorry we have run out of time, but do email us international at hearts.ac.uk um, and we'll be able to answer any queries that you do have. Um, I'm just going to play a short video now just of some Hertfordshire scenes that you'll be able to see when you do join us in September. But thank you very much for Nathan as well for giving up your time to join us for the session. Say lots of really useful information. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. And we can't wait to see you in September.